Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to our worship service today. Today we are celebrating Palm Sunday. Uh, normally on this Sunday, we would have all the kids up in the front singing their song, and they would have their palm branches, and we'd be handing all those out. But this year, uh, a little more low-key, we're focusing on the words and the hymns that we'll be singing. Welcome all of you to our worship service. If you're a guest or visitor, please don't forget to sign our guest register in the entryway. We'd love to have you come back again. Services coming up this week during Holy Week. Monday, Thursday, communion service, 7 o'clock Thursday. Good Friday, Canterbury service, 7 o'clock Friday. And the Easter sunrise service, 7 o'clock a.m. on Easter Sunday. We'll start now with our opening hymn, and it is hymn number 230, Lord Jesus Christ, be present now. that we're following this morning is the service of the word and for the people at home that is on page 38 in the front of the hymn the grace of our lord jesus christ and the love of god and the fellowship of the holy spirit be with you and also with you we have come into the presence of god who created us to love and serve him as his dear children but we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me, According to your unfailing love, cleanse me from my sins and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. 
We praise you, O God, for the great acts of love by which you have redeemed us through your Son, Jesus Christ, as he was acclaimed by those who scattered their garments and branches of palms in his path. So may we always hail him as our King and follow him with perfect confidence, for he lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. <laughs> The Old Testament lesson for our focus today on Palm Sunday is the prophecy recorded by Zechariah, chapter 9, verses 9 and 10. Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and brings salvation. He is humble and is riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem. The battle bow will be taken away and he will proclaim peace to the nations. His kingdom will extend from sea to sea, from the river to the ends of the earth. Here ends our Old Testament lesson. Our responsive psalm for today is psalm number 24 that is found in the hymnal on page 73 psalm 24 let the lord enter he is the king of glory the earth is the lord's and everything in it the world and all who have in it for he founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. He will receive blessing from God his Savior. Let the Lord enter. He is the King of glory. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors. That the King of glory be from him. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Who is he, this King of glory? Oh, lift up your heads, O you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors. That the King of glory may come in. Who is he, the King of glory? The Lord Almighty, He is the King of glory. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Let the Lord enter. He is the King of glory. Our epistle lesson is recorded in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. Paul writes these words. Indeed, let this attitude be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Though he was by nature God, he did not consider equality with God as a prize to be displayed. But he emptied himself by taking the nature of a servant. When he was born in human likeness, his appearance was like that of any other man. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, Every knee will bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Here ends our epistle lesson. We'll continue now with the seasonal response in the season of Lent. All we like sheep have gone astray, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. 
By his wounds we are healed. Please stand for our gospel lesson. The Holy Gospel for today is recorded in Matthew chapter 21 and it's verses 1 through 11. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples telling them, <clears throat> Go to the village ahead of you. Immediately you will find a donkey tied there along with her coat. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you are to say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Tell the daughter of Zion, Look, your king comes to you, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did just as Jesus commanded them. They brought the donkey and the colt, laid their outer clothing on them, and he sat on it. A very large crowd spread their outer clothing on the road. Others were cutting branches from the trees and spreading them out on the road. The crowds who went in front of him and those who followed kept shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the height. When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up, asking, Who is this? And the crowds were saying, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Here ends our gospel lesson. You may be seated for our next hymn. We'll continue now with hymn number 341. Crown him with many crowns.
<clears throat> this morning we're going to be especially looking at our gospel lesson. And when you look at the gospel lesson, you're also looking at the Old Testament lesson from Zechariah. So Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 through 11. The Lord needs them. and He will send them at once. And this took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Tell the daughter of Zion, look, your king comes to you, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The crowds who went in front of him and those who followed kept shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And then, who is this? This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. These are God's words for our meditation this morning. <clears throat> well, dear Christian friends, as we celebrate Palm Sunday, we celebrate a very important Christian festival that reminds us of the fact that Jesus really is the king of the universe. But on that, on that day, it was not something that was easily seen and distinguished. But he proves it in all that he did, because he did all of that for us. In our Lent series that we've been doing on the Wednesday evenings, we've been looking at overestimating and underestimating. And it seems like it's pretty co consistent throughout all of those different examples that we looked at, that it's very easy to overestimate earthly things and underestimate spiritual blessings. And so today, as we take a look at Jesus riding to Jerusalem, it's pretty easy to see that people are underestimating the arrival of King Jesus. <clears throat> now, there's going to be a lot of fanfare. There's going to be a lot of things that are going on that are going to bring out that this was a special occasion. But again, the people are mis missing why this occasion is so special, what it all means, and its importance to each and every one of us in our personal lives. And so as we look at Jesus riding into Jerusalem, we see a very humble event that is taking place. Humble in all of its outward trappings. A one-man procession. And that one man is riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. He is dressed in his regular street clothes, probably the only clothes that he owns. His procession is one that kind of turns up at the very last second, kind of like a flash mob that we have in our world and in our culture today, but those are publicized so everybody knows exactly when it is, where it is, and even how you are supposed to dress and act once you arrive at that scene, suddenly and unexpectedly. Jesus is accompanied by fishermen, tax collectors, zealots, 12 individuals that, when you look at them, you kind of wonder, is this the best that you can do? These are the men that you found to follow you and that are going to be so important in your kingdom? And these men, as they're walking in, are thinking, Jesus is about to come into his kingdom and will be ones who will be ruling over all these people who are crying out and exalting Jesus and giving him praise, and they're kind of looking at one another and at Jesus and thinking, this is what we were waiting for. We were waiting for Jesus to really show who he is, what he's going to do, and what he's accomplishing. And in doing so, they totally underestimated everything that Jesus was doing. They underestimated because they 
overestimated the outward trappings, the humble trappings, and they forgot to take a look at what was the big thing that was going on. And so they missed it. And for us not to miss it, we have to remember what that big thing was first and foremost. Adam and Eve, because of their sin, were kicked out of the Garden of Eden. They were cursed with death. That would eventually come. They lived a long, long time, but death eventually came, and sin came into this world, and all of their descendants inherited that sinful nature. And no matter what they tried to do, they could not clean up that very first sin. They couldn't pay for it. They couldn't make up for it. It was impossible for them to do so. But right away, God assured them that he would take care of it. He didn't dismiss their sin as something minor. Oh, don't worry about it. I've got it all taken care of. But he let them know the full extent of their punishment and the punishment in the world for all that they had done. And he said, despite all of that, I still love you, and I will take care of it. You will have a descendant who will eventually come to bring salvation. And the Old Testament prophets, as they also looked forward to the coming of the Messiah, the Savior, Jesus Christ, gave us bits and pieces, gave us glimpses, gave us prophecies about his coming, and Zechariah, some five to six hundred years before Jesus came, he had a very special vision that talked about him coming specifically, riding humbly on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey, and to make, make sure that people realize this is the king the one that we've been waiting for. And it's for God's people who are the people of Zion, God's heavenly kingdom. But those Old Testament prophets and those Old Testament people also, they can't see the glory of Jesus that's going to be revealed. They have God's words that are giving them a glimpse. But seeing a glimpse of great glory is not the same thing as seeing that great glory when it is exposed, when it is revealed, and when it comes to us to be able to worship and praise Him. When Jesus was born, there was a tiny glimpse of that. The angels came, and the glory of the Lord shone all around them, and the only witnesses were shepherds. Shepherds watching over their flocks. But this was a special event, and wise men came from far away because they knew that the stars had told them <clears throat> the king was born. And the king was in danger right away and had to flee to Egypt with his parents, and it would be some years before he comes back, and there he would be known as Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. Nothing connected with the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem, but instead one of the other small little by towns. Not that Bethlehem was real huge either, but it was prophesied in the Bible from Nazareth. And as people got to know Jesus during his earthly ministry, that was how he was referred to from Nazareth, from Galilee. And immediately their response would be, oh, why is that important? Nothing good comes from Nazareth. There aren't any major biblical prophecies that would even make us possibly think that this could be the Messiah. He's from Nazareth. He's from the wrong side of the tracks. And how can we really expect great things from him? Three of his disciples saw his glory on the day of transfiguration, right before we started the season of Lent, just a little under 40 days ago. They saw that glory, and they were 
totally amazed and speechless about all of that. And as soon as they came down from the mountain, Jesus said, it's time to go to Jerusalem to die. And now they're walking in beside him as Jesus rides him. And they're wondering, why did Jesus talk about dying? He's got power. People know him. People respect and look up to him. People are praising him. And the words that they are using, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Those words give an indication that they see a connection between Jesus and the Messiah, the son of David, whom God had made a promise to, King David, that from his descendants, there would be that great king, and that would be Jesus. But as they're, as they're crying out, Hosanna to the son of David, they're also thinking, underestimating. What kind of a king will he be? King of the universe? No, no. They are overestimating his earthly connections and the big time of the moment where they're all gathered and emotions are all high and it's a great event. They're thinking, here is the one who will rescue us from Rome. Not their souls, not their salvation, but this individual might rescue us from Rome. And five days later on Good Friday, they given up that hope because he's standing before Pilate and he's about to receive his sentence. And they have been convinced to cry out, crucify him, crucify him. Rome looks like they have won. And this poor, wretched man has lost. And so Jesus was totally underestimated throughout his ministry for all that he was here to do and to accomplish. He did not come to rule. Jesus came to save. And that's so much bigger than ruling. Rulers have a certain period of time. And in the expanse of history, it's a tiny period of time. But in the expanse of eternity, Jesus has always been ruling, still rules now, and will continue to rule in all eternity. And we as believers will get to spend that eternity with him under his kingdom, giving him praise, and celebrating all the works that he did and all the things that he accomplished. Jesus did not come to command. You have to do this. You must never do that. But he came to invite. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. He still will definitely uphold the laws that God has put before all people for how we are to live here in this world and in this life. Those are still in effect. Those are still very important. But he wants to invite to a way of escape from the penalty of not keeping those laws perfectly. And he wants us to join in him in his kingdom. He is not here to demand. When kings come in their glory and they speak, there are people that immediately work to carry out whatever it is the king says. And that's their job. The king said, we're going to go get it done. And if we don't, you know, he's going to punish us and we're not going to be in our position any longer. But Jesus did not come to demand, command. He came to invite and to give. Jesus gives us a gift. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God 
is eternal life in Christ Jesus. And as a gift that is a huge comfort to each and every one of us because it's not what we earn. It's not our wages. Our wages are worthless because they lead to death. But a gift leads to eternal life. And that gift can be ours because Jesus work and righteousness has covered us with his robe of righteousness and our sins are hidden we have been clean we have jesus in our hearts we have the holy spirit in our lives and we look for the opportunities to constantly worship our savior jesus christ this one man procession is an important event This is the real king. This isn't just a big moment in the life of Jesus. This, this is the real king. And Jesus, as that king knows, his work is almost done. People may not be praising him for all of the right reasons then, but you and I get to praise him for the right reasons because we know that he did it for each and every one of us to help us when we're preoccupied with all the things of this world, distracted by all the things in this world, by all the created things rather than the creator, by all this earthly blessings rather than the spiritual blessings that our God is also in charge of. The here and now, the what have you done for me lately? compared to what have you done for me in history and for all eternity. This event is very spectacular. This is very good. And God wants us to know and to appreciate all that Jesus is doing and all that he is accomplishing. He's about to be betrayed. He's about to be arrested. He's going to be sentenced, crucified, and all of these things are going to be done without a fight. He's going to be made fun of that he called himself a king. In fact, that's going to be the title that's going to be hanging on the top of his cross. <clears throat> the king of the Jews. And people don't like that, and they're going to make fun about him. And yet they don't realize that he's even bigger than that. He's the king of all people. And God does not want us to reject him. He's the one that came to take the wrath, the punishment for every sin, for everyone throughout history. He is the ruler of the universe. 